That's Friday. Friday. Yeah. That's Friday. That's what? That's Friday. Then. What about Friday? That's Friday. This Friday? God. Okay. Probably be the same kind of thing. Maybe two class, two problems in class. One for take home. Take a little more time, maybe. All right. Okay. We're. Uh, if you remember, we were looking at bending in beams. We we're looking at pure bending, uh, taking it that, uh, for the most part, our beams are prismatic. Remember what that means? We're looking, for the most part, at pure bending and prismatic beams. Remember what prismatic beams? You don't really have to worry about it too much, I guess, because we're not going to look at any other type of beams. Um, yeah, I don't have I don't have it on there. We didn't. We, yeah, it was section eight. We skipped. Uh, prismatic beams, if you remember, are those with symmetry about the y-axis where we typically take x to be axial axial down the beam itself. And then our bending is either in the plus or the minus z direction using the right hand rule to define applied moment of some kind. So we've been looking at that. Uh, we also have been looking at uh, cross sections that might be uh, uh, a little bit irregular in that they're not always circular, not always rectangular. They're always prismatic, but they've also been uh, isotropic. They've also always been a single material in the beam. Now we're going to look at, uh, at uh, composite beams. They'll still be prismatic in shape, but now we're going to allow for the possibility that uh, part of the beam will be made of a different material. So maybe this, this upper part of the beam is one material and the lower part of the beam is another material. It's not uncommon to do that kind of thing, especially with uh, structural wood materials to have uh, uh, plywood is certainly a composite beam. Um, there are also uh, lots of things where, lots of times where we might have uh, a steel beam for a lot of strength and then maybe some wood decoration applied to it uh, and we'll be able to look at that now to see will the wood itself be able to take any of the load or are we putting that on merely for decorative uh, looks and the like. So we'll start out real simple with uh, a beam just like that. In cross section, we'll let it uh, be a simple rectangular beam. We know automatically where that neutral axis is. Do uh, you remember, I hope, what the importance to us is of the neutral axis. Sorry? Yeah, that's that's the transition point between um, think for example in that type of bending, that's the transition point between the compression we feel on the top for the type of bending I showed and the tension we feel on the bottom. So there'd be compression on the top and then tension on the bottom and that transition from one to the other is through the neutral axis. Remember also that that neutral axis coincides with the uh, area centroid of that cross section. Uh, that was especially important for us to, to know how to find that when we're looking at 
more irregular, though prismatic shapes. All right, so we're going to add the possibility that there's two different materials. One material on the top, one material on the bottom. With the interface between the two, uh, it can, can be anywhere. It need not be at the, um, at the neutral axis. So, we're going to have that type of situation now. We need to look at, at what, the, uh, what the deal with this is. Now, things change a bit with this different material. Uh, this can be the, the uh, strain diagram. If you remember, both the strain and the stress are linear across the interface with this neutral axis being uh, the, the intercept, if you will, between the two. Things are a little bit different, though, with the stress. The stress diagram on this is going to be a little bit different uh, because of the different material we have um, at the two points. The, the, uh, the uh, bulk of the material for this example will stay exactly the same. We'll have compression at one place and tension at the other. That's not going to change. That's a, a direct response to this strain. But because these two materials have different modulus of elasticity, remember that's the E, then the stress diagram will be a little bit different. However, it's still, uh, it's still linear, still intercepts through this neutral axis, but for example, uh, if the upper material is a little bit softer, a little bit lower modulus of elasticity, then the stress will be still linear, but uh, the upper material will only be able to hold uh, less stress by a factor of the difference in the modulus of elasticity. We'll set that up now. So for, for reference purposes, I'll call the top material 1 and the bottom material 2. Remember that, that uh, the stress is directly related to the strain by the modulus of elasticity. So if we put a, a one on each of those, actually I don't need a, uh, I don't necessarily need a subscript on the, on the strain. The strains both are the same. That's a mechanical response. And then for the lower one, the same type of thing. Oops, that should be a two there. And for both of these, we remember that it's linear with position. All right, so let's set up and see if we can figure just what this difference is and then how we're going to be able to calculate what these strains and stresses are in these composite beams. All right, so here's our cross-section with some place being this transition from one material to another. Beam of cross-sectional area width B and height H. And we'll look at some little differential piece of area as we've done before. And we'll do that anywhere across the intersection and anywhere across the face. In this uh, 
in this upper part here, DF1, the force on that little bit of interface there, of course, is the stress on that face over the area of it. No different than what we've seen before. And we know what that, that stress is, if we remember. And then you can see that we're going to integrate over this entire face. We'll be able to pick that up. Same thing for phase two. So just everything we've got above, just change any subscripts to a two. And then we'll, uh, we'll be able to determine what the forces are across the whole face. And then, of course, those forces have got to balance to zero because this is a static situation. So uh, when we do that, we get that uh, DF1 will equal 1 over N DF2, where N is defined as the ratio of the modulus of elasticity because everything else drops out. Fairly straightforward, just a simple, uh, a simple static setup here, because the forces, of course, must sum to zero. I guess in this case the differential forces, but it doesn't matter. It all shapes out to be the same. So our method of analysis then is to do this. Here's the original cross section. neutral axis. Uh, in this case, pleasantly enough, it's right down the center because of the, uh, the regular shape of the intersect of the uh, cross section. Though it need not be. There's our transition material. Now I, I have to make a pick here. So I'll say for this example, of n greater than 1. Uh, doesn't need to be. It depends on whatever the materials are. But in this case, we'll say that because what I have to do next uses that assumption. Um, but it doesn't matter. The same kind of thing can be done in the opposite direction. So in other words, E2 is greater than E1 here. Uh, E2, this bottom material, being the the stouter, the stiffer, the more resistant to bending, if you will. We can't analyze that type of beam with the methods we've got. For pure bending in a prismatic uh, beam, our methods will not handle this situation where we have a difference in material. So we're going to transition this beam to something a little bit different. Uh, if, if the upper material here is a little bit softer, the, see the trouble is all of our methods can only handle a single material. We can't handle this composite beam with our methods. So we're going to make an equivalent beam out of a single material that has the same characteristics as this beam. So we'll take out this, this stouter, stiffer material that I made with that uh, initial assumption there. If I take out this material that has a greater modulus of elasticity and replace it with just this material, I'll need a lot more of that material down here. I'll need to make the beam a lot fatter. That's taking out this E2 
replacing it with a lot more E1 because E1 is less. Now this beam is an entire single isotropic material which our methods can handle. Remember this beam was a width B. So the question becomes how much of this second material or how much of this how much of the second material must I replace with the first so that I have a beam that can handle the same amount of stresses? And the answer is that beam must now be of width NB, where N is that ratio of the um, the ratio of the modulus of elasticity. When we do that, a couple things happen. One is our our uh, stress profile now is exactly as we could calculate it before. where the top is in compression, the bottom is in tension through the neutral axis. Remember before when I had this, this other material, I had a uh, I had that little jag I had to put in because of the different material. So we don't move the neutral axis after we change well, the shape? Uh, we do we do have to as we calculate if you remember our stress is calculated from MC over I in this case if I'm using C it's the maximum and uh, we have the understanding of the minus sign in there um, but just by inspection we know where it's compression and where it's tension the thing is the I here is of the new cross section. The neutral axis is where it was before, but we do have to use this new the new cross section to determine what the what the uh, uh, moment first moment of area is. That will allow us to find out what the maximum stress is in the upper material and the maximum is in the lower material uh, using the methods we've had before, which only work with isotropic solids, solids of a single material. All right, so that's the setup. Let's uh, give it a try. So we'll, we'll always know N if we just know what the materials are, right? Yeah. So we can just look at those yeah, yeah. That's exactly what we're going to have right now. So imagine we have a steel core zero point seven five inches there and three inches high, and then has on it a brass cladding. Brass is kind of pink looking, so it's a perfect choice. So there's this brass cladding here. Now, uh, maybe that's cosmetic. Maybe it's um, uh, for uh, uh, er erosion purposes or something. Brass does not rust as, as uh, readily as steel might. And we'll let that thickness be 0.4 inches on both sides. Okay, so. Um, We can do it either way. 
we can re we can replace the stiffer material with much more of the softer material or we can replace the softer material with much less of the stiffer material but the calculations all come out to be the same so it doesn't matter which you do just as long as you do it in the right direction but I'll pick it such that we'll take out the steel and put in the brass so we look up E for steel we look up E for brass and they're uh, different of a, about a factor of two give or take a little bit that would be 1.93. So I arbitrarily choose to replace the steel with a higher modulus of elasticity with the softer brass. I'm going to need more of the brass. So now our Now our cross-section looks something like, uh, well, we've still got that 0.4 inches on this side, but now I'm going to take out this stiffer steel and put in more brass to replace it because the brass can't hold as much stress on its own, so I'm going to need more of it. And then I'll have the original 0.4 inches over here so that this is now a single material in cross-section how much do I need to put in this inside n times the 0.75 which is what two 1.448 I believe all right and that makes the entire beam now conveniently this calculations always work out perfectly uh, oh, not 2.5 2.25 inches if I recall or if I did it right and now we do the very same calculation with that one. Uh, which we've been able to do before. Alright, give it some kind of load. Let's say it's 40 kip inches. Also known as a Pinch. There's Brandon. How was spring break, Brandon? It's busy. Come back. Ended a little early. Real busy doing what? Working. Working. Not bumming around like some of the rest of you. DJ, what'd you do? Work. As hard as Brandon did? Because Brandon barely made it in here today. Sure. You came bouncing in, smile on your face. Let's go. All right. So we've got some, uh, some things we need to calculate here. For example, we need to find the modulus of a or sorry, the, uh, the first moment of area, the moment of inertia, um, which is actually second moment of area, uh, of the new cross section, which isn't too big a deal because it's still rectangular, so that's nice and easy. And we've got all those numbers. It now has a base of two and a quarter inches, and the height was still three inches, right? Yep. That's Q. And so, uh, straight calculation of what that comes out to be 5.063, I believe. Right? Remember, this is all of the new cross section. Maybe new should even be in quotes. 
it's not the true cross-section. We're not actually replacing the beam with this solid brass beam. Just doing it so for our calculations so that now we can figure out the maximum stress. Now, remember, this is all brass, so this will be the stress in the brass, which is different than the stress in the steel, because they have different modulus of elasticity. Luckily, the uh, moment of, uh, or the neutral axis is the same for both. We don't need to... For this example, we don't need to change that. We will in a second. Um, oh yeah, that was the 5.063. Oh, sorry, inches to the fourth. Giving us kips per square inch, which is 11.9. Now, here's where we need to be careful because that's not the same as the stress that's in the steel. The strain is the same in the two because they're mechanically connected, but their response to that depends upon their response to that depends upon their individual uh, modulus of elasticity, and so we will find the stress in the steel by simply multiplying it by that factor n, which is about double, but not quite. And as expected, because the greatest, the greater uh, stiffness of the steel it can take almost twice the stress. With those two numbers then we can decide uh, are those are those dimensions uh, appropriate for what we needed to, to withstand in the line. Fairly straightforward. Gets a little bit more complicated when we have non-rectangular uh, cross-sections. So if you've absorbed that simple start, we'll do one of those. Good clean start. We gotta, we gotta crawl before we can walk, walk before we can run, run before we get hobbled and have to use a cane and we start all over again. All right, so imagine this beam. We have a T-beam. Of course, symmetric about the y-axis. So this is uh, steel. 200 millimeters across the top. 20 there, 300 down, and also 20 there. Uh, this this flange is, is 300. But I'm gonna wait for a second before I put in my uh, my dimension on that. Now what we're gonna do is perhaps for decorative purposes. Most people like wood more than they like Look at that. That looks like a couple pieces of wood, doesn't it? Should have brought brown chalk for today. I just wasn't thinking. 
most people in their homes prefer the look of wood over steel, so maybe we're putting some wood in there for decorative purposes, but also expect it to take some of the load. And that load, oh, and then down here, 300 millimeters and 75 across here and of course symmetric on both sides all dimensions in millimeters so we do have a little bit of the steel beam hanging out at the top there sticking out E for steels 200 gigapascals and E for the wood. I think I picked oak uh, for some numbers. Oak looks nice. 12.5. Quite a bit less. Alright, we need to find then uh, for a load of 50 kilonewton meters. Remember, that's what we were doing, the shear sh moment diagrams last, uh, well, two weeks ago now. Find the maximum stresses. We need to know it, both the steel and the wood. All right, here. Uh, this N, if we make it uh, steel over the wood, I think is 16. So if we take out the brass, which is much greater in its modulus of elasticity, if we take out that steel, we're going to have to put in a lot of wood to replace it. So, uh, we can do either, but um, typically, if you just do the same thing uh, as what we've set up, then you're less likely to make a mistake. So, we're going to have to put in a whole bunch of steel. Or, take out the steel, put in a whole bunch of wood to replace it. Where now this across the top is 16 times 200 millimeters. That was the original dimension, the 200. The bottom is now a width of 16 times 20 millimeters. And then we've got the original 75 millimeters of wood. So maybe that looks about like that. That's our new beam, and it's all wood. That's why we. Uh, that's why it's so big because. The wood, we just need a lot more wood to replace the steel we took out to get the equivalent response. All right, which means, of course, we're going to have a new neutral axis. that we have to determine because uh, we need to calculate our I with response to that.
I for that. All right, so that's what we get to do first here. All right, remember how to find the, find the neutral axis? Because it's from, it's with respect to that that we need to calculate this new um, moment of inertia. Pick some reference point, and then from that reference point, calculate that quantity. Maybe if we take that as the reference point and then calculate everything from there. It's not too difficult. It's kind of two simple composite shapes. And we need to figure out where the individual uh, parts are. So probably just as easy to do that as part one. And then that as part two. Uh, I don't know how if it could be much simpler than that. Probably the easiest way to do it. It tends to go pretty straightforward. If you break it into two pieces. You don't have to, but anything else, just extra calculation. You can change anything. Alright, Y bar for piece one with respect to our arbitrarily chosen reference point. stresses are zero. We'll actually need that for the old axis, but because that's how we calculate our uh, moment of inertia <coughs> with respect to that. And then the bottom area is what? 2 times 75 plus 16 times 20 times 300. column 
and the sum of the last one. Respect to this arbitrary reference, and then otherwise we know it's right in the center because we're doing prismatic beams only. From there, remember, we need to calculate the moment of inertia with respect to that neutral axis. respect to this new uh, neutral axis, this new century. on Y bar. What is it? 120 millimeters? Not meters. I hope not.
moment of inertia of that second of, of this new cross section, remember, with respect to that neutral axis. Remember, it's just the 112 BH cubed straight out of the book for a rectangular cross section. And then AD squared is the parallel axis there, part of it. Check numbers as you go along if you can. 
So you've got that 120, and then you get I from respect to that. That's the centroid of this upper little piece. D is the distance from the new neutral axis, which we just located. That's the 120 you found. Um, it's the distance up to that. This uh, other one has its neutral axis somewhere down there, so that would be D2. They're not drawn in the center, uh, but they would be because these are prismatic beams. So they're symmetric about the y axis. Could be a different number. So two point two point two times ten to the minus third. That's what I have. Yeah. Okay. So do AB squared is equal to D. 
minutes. Yeah, yeah. Very, very easy to forget those those squares. All right. Now that we have that, then we can figure out this maximum stress. M is fifty kilonewton meters. The wood is greatest in stress, the greatest distance away from that, which is the 200 millimeters or 0.2 meters. That's the new neutral axis. And then over the new moment of inertia. And that'll give us kilonewtons per square meter. And remember, that's in the wood because for this part, we're imagining that's all we've got. Then we've got to back up and get the stress in the steel, which will be a lot greater because it can hold so much more. Six megapascals. And then sigma max in the steel will be n times that. And that's at the same location because that's still the farthest distance. That's where the steel will also be in the greatest stress. And so we got to make sure that this, the, both the steel and the wood can stand that. Seventy-three megapascals. We don't need to go back and redo this, taking out the wood and putting in the steel, which we could. We'd have a, the original T-beam with little tiny pieces of steel, or uh, replace the wood with steel that would be 1 16th the original with here. But these numbers should still come out to be the same, so there's no reason to do it again, other than as a check. Okay. Friday's test, should we make that all take home so you don't have to worry about, you can easily double check all these little numbers you're calculating? What's the whole test about? Chapter 4, 5, and 6. So we have axial loading torsion, and then uh, these 